Hoagland with the UW-Madison Entomology Department and Field Crops Extension. I'm here at a soybean field in one of our research plots in late August 2008 in a soybean field that is uh, at the R5 growth stage. And I'm here today to talk about an insect pest that we commonly get questions about both at the campus at UW-Madison and our colleagues at the UW Extension County offices. And this is regarding Japanese beetle. A uh, Japanese beetle is not a key insect pest. It's not as important or causing as much economic damage as, say, soybean aphid, but it is something we do get questions on, so I'd like to address that today. A lot of us think of Japanese beetle more in the context of homeowner or ornamental pest. Um, the adult beetles do quite a bit of defoliating on trees, such as linden or grape plants. Um, and um, rose bushes, for example, will have common problems. In its immature or larval stage, homeowners are really dealing with it as, all, or, as our golf courses with um, turf, below turf, the, the uh, immatures feeding there. Um, in soybeans, they can also defoliate. So that's what I just want to speak briefly about today. The adult beetle can defoliate soybean leaves. A Japanese beetle has one generation per year, so that's one thing to keep in mind. So we do know when during the season we will see adult beetles. They spend the winter below uh, sod and grass, turf pr primarily, as larvae, um, and they will pupate in the spring when temperatures start to warm up. Beetles in southern Wisconsin, the Japanese beetle, will start to emerge from the soil um, around mid-June in southern Wisconsin, and that process continues and tends to peak around mid-July. So basically in terms of soybean management for insects, we start to receive calls and questions and see Japanese beetle adults in soybean fields generally around mid-July and then throughout the rest of the growing season. Uh, there's a couple important things to remember. The first one is that we're actually not scouting for the number of Japanese beetles in the field. Instead, we're actually looking at the percent defoliation on a soybean leaf. And there are a few different insects that can defoliate a soybean leaf. So you really want to uh, keep in mind which pest you're looking for, uh, but our ultimate thresholds are going to be based on percent defoliation of the leaf and of that canopy. And that defoliation, as we're talking about today, can be uh, caused by the Japanese beetle, which of course you'd be noticing in the field um, if you see those uh, metallic beetles that we described. Uh, the type of defoliation you'll see from Japanese beetle feeding is best described as a skeletonization of the leaf. Sometimes people will say it leaves uh, sort of a lace-like pattern. Uh, Japanese beetles will usually, they certainly start to feed on the top of the soybean canopy and then they can progress throughout the canopy but certainly they'll feed from the tops or the edges of leaves and they'll really um, feed on that plant tissue and leave behind the leaf veins. So it does give you that skeletonized or lace-like appearance. Um, other insects in soybeans that can cause defoliation, and that's again what we look at for thresholds, is percent defoliation. Other than Japanese beetle, this can be caused by second generation bean leaf beetle, but the bean leaf beetle feeding is very different. I usually compare bean leaf beetle feeding on soybean leaves uh, to a paper hole punch. It's a fairly round, regular uh, feeding hole, and so that's different than this, this all skeletization effect. Uh, grasshopper feeding, for example, is again different. It's got a very ragged kind of feeding, as do some caterpillar pests, usually from the leaf edge inwards, a very ragged pattern. So regardless of what insect is causing the defoliation, as we move into talking about insect thresholds for soybeans, we're looking at the percent leaf defoliation. To scout soybean fields for a percent defoliation to make a treatment decision or management decision, um, uh, you would come into the soybean canopy and um, look at at least 10 plants throughout the field. Um, for larger fields, you want to look at, at more plants, around 20 plants, but certainly get at least 10 plants. And from each of those 10 plants, uh, they should be distributed throughout the field um, to give you a good um, indication of the level of defoliation. You want to look at three different areas of the plant. Um, you would take a trifoliate from the top of the canopy. You can see I've just done that here with um, some Japanese beetle feeding. Um, but you'd also want to take a trifoliate from the middle of the canopy and the lower third of the canopy. Again, because in that middle and lower third of the canopy, Japanese beetle feeding may be actually quite a bit less than what you're seeing as you walk through the field on the top of the canopy. 
So with this then you'll have, from 10 different plants, you'll have about 30 trifoliates. Based on the 30 leaf sample that you've just collected in the field, the soybean defoliation thresholds are as follows. During pre-bloom, the vegetative stages of soybean growth, the economic threshold is 30% defoliation. From bloom to pod fill, the economic threshold actually drops down to 15 to 20% defoliation. Certainly with current prices for soybean, you really wouldn't want to exceed about 20% defoliation threshold. And then during pod fill to maturity, unless pod feeding is observed, you'd go back up to about 25% defoliation. Be Japanese beetles typically do not move to pod feeding. That is really a concern more with bean leaf beetle. Both scouting and treatment decision information for Japanese beetle is contained in UW Extension Publication A3646, Pest Management in Wisconsin Field Crops. Um, in this booklet, in the Soybean Insect Management section, there is a graphic that shows different levels of soybean leaf defoliation so that you can compare the percentage defoliation that you're seeing in your 30 plant 30 leaf sample with that graphic in, in the management guide. Also in this book, of course, are um, different insecticide products that are labeled for Japanese beetle um, if economic threshold levels are reached with the defoliation. So that can also help to guide treatment decisions. So again, based on your scouting, uh, a couple other closing remarks would be that often we'll see Japanese beetle feeding, and this happens with grasshopper as well. Um, you may observe Japanese beetle feeding predominantly on the edges of fields. So in that sense, uh, a field edge treatment may be warranted rather than the whole field. But you'd really want to inspect the whole field, scout the entire field before you make that decision, because certainly um, Japanese beetle can be found throughout the field. And then finally to be aware of um, Japanese beetle feeding can look quite um, stark at the top of the canopy but really be sure to check that middle and lower part of the canopy as well. Um, there may not be as much feeding lower in the canopy. We've moved to another soybean field, which is uh, at the R5 growth stage and getting on towards R6. And one of the things that I wanted to talk about here was soybean aphid. And many of the common questions we get late in the season, so typical questions about soybean aphid management in August, um, and an overview of the 2008 growing season and going into the 2009 growing season, some things to be aware of. One of the first things to cover is the white aphid morph. And this is something that we start to see in about mid-July um, throughout Wisconsin. Um, this is the same species, it is soybean aphid, aphis glycines, and the aphid starts to take on a different color. Of course, the typical soybean aphid color is that green colored soybean aphid. Um, as plants get into the R3 through R5 growth stage, uh, research by Dr. David Ragsdale at the University of Minnesota through the North Central Soybean Research Program uh, research collaboration, with, which Wisconsin uh, is part of, um, and David Ragsdale has uh, found that the white soybean aphid morph actually is forming in response to host plant quality. Between the R3 and R5 growth stages, uh, soybean aphid detects a decline in the host plant quality and it will take on this smaller size and this very white color. Uh, what we do know about the soybean aphid white dwarf, even though it's the same um, species, it's, you can see both the green and the white forms on the plant at the same time. Um, we know that the white morphs live half as long as the green morph and that their output of nymphs, the females uh, producing live nymphs in the field, the white morph produces those nymphs at a rate that is 70% less than the green morph. So what that tells us is that this white Soybean morph, although it is feeding on soybean and it is uh, reproducing, it is going to have a slower trajectory and, and tend to grow slower than that green morph. So that's one thing to keep in mind as we have late season, a mix of both green and white aphids in the field, really knowing the proportion of um, white to green morphs. We still count the white soybean aphids as part of the economic threshold. Um, but knowing that if you're late season, nearing R5 growth stage, if you're in that R5 growth stage, 
you're mostly at the white morph stage and they're just hovering around 200, 250 aphids per plant, it's unlikely that they're going to, to grow very quickly and reach economic injury level. A common question in 2008 has been whether the economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant should be reduced in light of high soybean prices. Um, the short answer to that is that no, the economic threshold has not been lowered below 250 aphids per plant. It's important to keep in mind the difference between an economic threshold and an economic injury level. Uh, the research behind the economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant was conducted across six upper midwestern states, including Wisconsin, over three different years, uh, 2004 through 2006. At the time the research was conducted, uh, crop prices for soybean were about 550 to 650 bushels per acre, or six, uh, 550 to 650 um, per bushel. Um, the calculation based on our research looks at something called the economic injury level. This is the point essentially, you could think of it as the break-even point. The economic injury level is the number of insects that you would need to have on the crop that cause yield reductions equal to the cost of an insecticide treatment. So again, that break-even point is termed the economic injury level. The economic threshold, in our case 250 aphids per plant, is always set below the economic injury level to prevent insects and damage from reaching that level. And that's the case for all insect thresholds, not just the soybean aphid threshold. As I mentioned, when the research was conducted, crop prices were around 650 um, per bushel. At that time, the economic injury level, based on all of our, our yield data and comparisons across six states, that break-even point was at about 675 aphids per plant. And that allowed about a seven-day lead time when aphids were increasing from that economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant, you had about a seven day lead time to arrange for treatment and prevent that economic injury level. In light of increased crop prices, Dr. David Ragsdale at the University of Minnesota, the lead um, principal investigator of the research, has recalculated the economic injury level. So for example, at $15 per bushel yield, or $15 per bushel prices, an $8 control cost and an expected yield of 50 bushels per acre. That economic injury level has indeed dropped from the previous 675 aphids per plant to about 450 aphids per plant. Again, that break-even point has dropped, but the economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant is still below that revised economic injury level of 450 per plant in light of increased crop prices. So what this essentially does is it decreases the lead time uh, for treatment to about three to four days. Um, one of the other things to mention in closing about the threshold is that through our research throughout these, uh, the states supporting this, um, the economic threshold, we did actually treat aphids below 250 per plant. And at none of the sites were we able to actually detect a yield difference. So there is a point below the economic threshold where the presence of insects, in this case aphids, does not impact the crop yield. And that's the case with soybean aphid. So the take home message is that the economic threshold of 250 aphids per plant is still below the economic injury level, which is roughly around 450, 500 aphids per plant with the higher crop price as I, as I explained. One thing that was different during the 2008 growing season, due to flooding during over much of Wisconsin earlier in the season, we had replanted and late planted fields. Um, what this meant is that um, later into August, mid to late August, um, unlike other years, we had a cross section of plants that were between the R3 and R5 growth stage throughout, throughout Wisconsin, uh, depending on, on planting dates. So we had younger soybeans, really still within that uh, vulnerable treatment window, and the soybean aphid population had not yet crashed um, as we got closer to late August. Um, and this is an, a very good example of how um, scouting soybeans for aphids should continue through the R5 growth stage. 2008 was a perfect example of how important that was.
um, in many years, and I guess you could say the typical year, um, by late August, um, soybean aphid populations, even if they haven't crashed, most of that um, crop is um, in the R5 growth stage. Um, it should still be watched, but I, again, 2008 um, was a very good example of how important soybean aphid scouting is through that R5 growth stage.